the future of Yacht Rock? If we started all over today, this is what we would sound like. It'd be a shame if someone played that on the radio. Long before Linkin Park emerged on the music scene at the beginning of the 21st century, new metal was already a well-established subgenre of alternative rock or metal, depending on how you look at it. We all knew Korn, we all knew Helmet, Slipknot, but around 2000, 2001, Linkin Park was new metal. Uh, the first song I heard was One Step Closer. Uh, so I would have been, you know, in my early mid thirties when this album, when, when that came out and I was still kind of angry. So needless to say, One Step Closer had a great deal of appeal to me. The first song on the album, is Paper Cut. And I'm not really sure why that's the opening track. I don't really love this song. It's a good song, but it's not. When I think about it and compare it to what else I'm going to hear on Hybrid Theory, I don't understand why Paper Cut's the first track. Uh, in the end, peaked at number two in the top 40. Uh, so this band quickly established a following beyond just uh, modern rock radio and, and alternative radio. Hybrid Theory would go on to become a Diamond Certified 10 times Platinum album. It would pick up a Grammy nomination for Best Rock Album. It won the Grammy for Best Hard Rock Performance for Crawling, a song about Bennington's substance abuse issues. And I can't believe the video lost to Limp Bizkit. You know, this album came out the same year, the same year and pro pro almost as successful of an album, Chocolate Starfish and the Hot Dog Flavored Water from Limp Bizkit. Whew. If you liked both albums equally, I think you just you just liked Loud and Angry because I think Linkin Park, I think the songwriting in Linkin Park was so much better. And I do think time has proven that Linkin Park endured in a way that Limp Bizkit did not. Anyway, I digress. Uh, Runaway is an underappreciated uh, new metal track. Points of Authority is a keeper. It's got a nasty groove to it. Pushing Me Away is a solid closer. But really, structure-wise, it's, it's a lot like Crawling if you listen to it. Uh, nonetheless, I do believe that Hybrid Theory is a classic, classic album. It is one of my favorite albums from that time period. I think if you claim to like new metal and you don't, and this album is not something you know frontwards and backwards and a part of your collection, I don't, I don't know about you. I don't know about you. Uh, Reanimation followed in 2002 uh, with Mike Shinoda and various other collaborators producing. This album went platinum. It's, it's a remix album it is the fourth best-selling remix album of all time by the way so interest in the band was still very high one step closer with jonathan davis uh, and then there was a remix with marilyn manson that was a bonus track on certain versions of this album those were really the two only tracks that i really cared for i'm not i'm not a big fan of the fact that lincoln park was a band that really liked to lean into these remixes i really feel like their music stood on its own very well i'm not sure i don't know i don't want to say that you know, this was an attempt to expand their fan base by, by doing these albums. Whew, I don't know if I'm going to get any hate for that, but I mean, that's just that's just how I feel about about uh, a lot those remix albums, really. OK, you know what? I'm going to be real honest with you. It's OK. I can't really in good conscience say that it's not at least worth listening. Meteora followed in 2003. I was produced and again, Don Gilmore was involved in producing. This album was almost as successful as Hybrid Theory. It went seven times platinum. Uh, it picked up a Grammy nomination for Best Rock Album. Somewhere I Belong was the Best Rock Video at the 2003 MTV Music Awards. Faint was a pretty awesome song. It was probably the second or third best song on the album. Numb was a huge, huge, huge song. It was maybe as huge as In The End. It probably dominates the, the, the story of the album on the whole. I remember... Uh, initially when this album came out, I was working in a Top 40 radio station when this song came out, and uh, the band did not want to release Numb as a single. So the record companies were telling us, yeah, but you know, this band is huge, and you know, you know, that Numb sure is awful good. Mmm, be a shame if someone played that on the radio. Anyway, Numb did go on to become a pretty successful <laughs> track at, at Top 40. The band did eventually change their mind about it being a single. From the inside it's, is nice and then it's not breaking the habit. I love the strings that linger throughout this song. I think I've said before in some of my other videos that I like. Uh, I do like when rock music incorporates elements of classical music. This was the fifth consecutive single from Meteora to hit number one on the Billboard Modern Rocks chart. So all five songs went to number one. The very worst part of you is me song about pushing someone away, if only even subconsciously. Um, hit the floor is okay, easier to run. <laughs> I made a note the other day, I don't, know, I don't know why I wrote this down. The future of Yacht Rock? 
maybe a century from now. That's This is what Yacht Rock will sound like. But it's a cool attempt to add some variety into their sound. They, they just kind of turned it down to seven. I, I would still say Meteora is maybe just a tad, maybe just a notch, not as, well, I don't know. I, I don't know. When I think about it, it's, I think Meteora is pretty strong, and I think it does stand up pretty well. Uh, with Hybrid Theory. Uh, Live in Texas dropped in 2003 uh, with various tracks recorded in Houston at what I think was Regent Stadium at the time. It's now Energy Stadium and um, at Texas Stadium in Irving. A live album that went platinum. I'm not a huge fan of live albums. I don't really feel like this adds anything to the mystique other than showing that they could play, they could do what they, they could recreate what it was they did live and they could sound good doing it live. I'll say it's a good live album. I don't, I can't really say that I loved it. Speaking of can't really say that I loved it, uh, Collision Course dropped in 2004. That was a collaboration with Jay-Z. So that was really interesting when it came out, considering the remix, remixy tendencies of this band, I'm not surprised. I shouldn't have been surprised <laughs> when when a, when an album came out with Jay Z, who was really on a pretty good run of his own at the time. This went platinum. Uh, the Numb Encore combination released as a as a combo single that got a lot of airplay. Um, it it won a Grammy actually for best rap and sung collaboration. Uh, there was also a, a, a mashup. Uh, that's the term. There was also a mashup of Dirt Off Your Shoulder and Lying From You. I personally just felt like it was okay. Uh, Collision Course didn't. I don't love the remix stuff, people. I'm sorry. <laughs> Minutes to Midnight dropped in 2007. Uh, it went four times platinum, so there's still an appetite for this band. It picked up a Grammy nomination for Best Hard Rock Performance for what I've done. This song was a number one song in the alternative charts for 15 weeks. There's very little Mike Shinoda in this track. The band actually kind of starts backing away from rap rock or rap metal to a degree on this album. It's not as prominent, it's not as strong a flavor in the overall uh, mix, I guess you could say. Of course, they didn't back away from it on Bleed It Out. That song was featured on Guitar Hero. They performed that on Saturday Night Live. That video won the Much Music Best International Video Group uh, that year in Canada. If you don't know what Much Music is, in Canada you do, but I mean, in, in Elsewhere, if you don't know what that is, uh, Shadow of the Day was the best rock video of the 2008 MTV VMAs. Given Up has really undeniable punk vibes and a 17 second scream from Chester. I don't know if that's the longest ever on record, but <laughs> damn, put me out of my misery. Yeah. Leave Out All the Rest has one of the best melodies of any Linkin Park song. Uh, you know, Lighters Up, you know what I mean? Uh, was not a huge hit. It was the fifth single. Uh, maybe at this point, five singles in after a previous album with five singles in, maybe there was, I don't know, maybe there was a little bit of Linkin Park burnout going on there. Uh, the opening track is Wake. Uh, the first time you hear it, the first time you hear it, you're kind of like, I wonder if Pink Floyd is trying something new. The The beginning of the album, is, I, I don't think it's what one would expect from Linkin Park. The first two thirds of this album is pretty solid. The last third is okay. Uh, in between, I don't know about that, in pieces. The band does continue to evolve on this album. There are more, I guess you could say, quiet moments on this album than uh, definitely what you'd expect. Um, in my opinion, this was a good, not great album. The live album Road to Revolution dropped in 2008. It was certified gold. Still, still live music and still selling well. This was released on CD and DVD. It was originally intended as an MTV original broadcast. Uh, it is definitely cool that Jay-Z shows up. It's just kind of lame when you have those collabs and then you have to have a substitute special guest or you just have to play the backing track. Uh, I think if you're a fan of Linkin Park, this is a pretty good, pretty good live album. And then Songs from the Underground dropped in 2008. It's a compilation of previously released tracks. Um, there's a version of Hunger Strike by Chris Cornell that features Chester Bennington on it. I'm putting this on the non-essential tier and you'll find out why in just a few minutes. We'll get to that. So it's the 21st century, and if you're a rock band, you have to do interesting things to get people's attention and hold people's attention. 8-Bit Rebellion. This was, well, Linkin Park was down to experiment. I don't think there's any doubt about that. This was a special piece of media created for gamers, really. It featured one new song called Blackbirds, which is a B, B plus song. Um, the versions of all the other songs on the whole really aren't, aren't a very listenable aren't a very enjoyable listening experience um, if you're not experiencing them in the game. So um, at this point, I would say that that is something for completists. 
so a few minutes ago, I, re- I referred to a, um, a compilation release that don't get it. And I'll tell you why. This is why A Decade Underground, it's a fan club release. There are a couple of extra songs here that weren't included on Songs from the Underground. In my opinion, Songs from the Underground is okay. Uh, I do believe, generally speaking, patchwork compilations for me are usually pretty hit or miss. Uh, In 2010, A Thousand Suns dropped. This was a platinum album, their fourth number one album. Picked up a Best Hard Rock Performance Grammy nomination for The Catalyst which was the first single. It's an absolute banger. When I first heard this, I thought I'm, I'm really I'm really looking forward to hearing A Thousand Suns. Blackout is crunchy. Wretches and Kings has these cool sort of public enemy vibes. They did Waiting for the End on Saturday Night Live. It was the second single from the album. Great song. Burning in the Skies. Smooth. Iridescent was featured in one of the Transformers movies. Beautiful song. Did I mention earlier that like a hundred years from now, this is what Yacht Rock might sound like? You know, here's the thing about this album. Look out. It's a freaking concept album. This is a more mature version of the band. This is uh, a band that's exploring themes of humanity, war, existential dread. It's not just everything sucks in here. It's everything sucks out here. When They Come For Me is unlike any other rap rock song they've done before. Robot Boys is unique. In my opinion, this album is their Dark Side of the Moon or OK Computer. Uh, it's cinematic. There's a confidence. There's a boldness. I don't. I they they're they're all over the place, and there are no swing and a misses on this album. You know what I mean? It's far more creative than anything they had done prior. This is the album where Lincoln Park really transitions from being really pissed off to seriously concerned. And in my opinion, this is a classic. Uh, this is a classic, amazing album. In my opinion. It's a keeper. It is It is one of their best. I don't know that I would say it is their best. Hybrid Theory Live Around the World in 2012 recorded. Um, uh, it was recorded all over the globe. It proves they are just as powerful live as they are in the studio. The crowd interaction on One Step Closer is awesome. Uh, Numb and Lying from You and Somewhere I Belong and Faint from Meteora Live Around the World are really great. Minutes to Midnight Live Around the World also dropped in 2012. All three of these basically dropped. I don't remember if they dropped on the same day. If you don't understand why Leave Out All the Rest is such an awesome song by this band, listen to the version on this album. So I'm just going to quickly go good, um, good, and good. Living Things arrived in 2012. Produced by Rick Rubin and Mike Shinoda. It went platinum. No Grammy nominations for Linkin Park this time around, which is a little unusual, all things considered. Uh, Burn It Down was the first single, which is a classic Linkin Park song. Lost in the Echoes, quintessential Linkin Park. The interactive video for this song might still be on YouTube. Um, I've always liked Castle of Glass. Powerless is a pretty good closer. Lies Greed Misery has a really cool driving energy to it. It has a cool groove. Skin to bone, yes. In My Remains is almost by the numbers, Linkin Park, though. And same for I'll Be Gone. Uh, until it breaks, I don't know. Let Skrillex do Skrillex. That's that's kind of my opinion on that. This is a tight 37-minute package. It They continue expanding and they continue exploring. This album goes back to being maybe a little more personal. Uh, and a little bit more about relationships. I really honestly thought that this album was just kind of, it was good. It wasn't great. Definitely not one of my favorites. The Studio Collection. All, oh no, all of my Linkin Park albums and CDs and cassettes are just scattered all over the place. I don't know where any of them are. If you get the Studio Collection, you've got the first five albums and reanimation all together. Uh, here we go with another remix album. It was called Recharged. Mike Shinoda and various other uh, producers contributed to this. It sold fairly well. It was a gold album. Uh, a Light That Never Comes was a collab with Steve Aoki that um, achieved a certain level of popularity. If you really like their remix albums, I'd say go for it. If you don't, I think it's an okay... See, here's the thing. It's nothing that I ever go back to uh, and probably never would. A Light That Never Comes, the remix compilation... The track with Steve Aoki gets, shall we say, further exploration. Uh, It is the best track from Recharge, so I guess if that's what you're going to do, do it with that one. Um, I don't, nah, (laughs) I don't really feel like that really worked any wonders for me to make me like the song any better. In 2014, The Hunting Party, the band's most aggressive album since Meteora, probably. I think of this as the... Yeah, we can still rock our asses off if we want to. Linkin Park album. Guitars, 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 crunchy, crunchy guitars. A lot of new metal vibes here. Like I said, this is probably 
don't know if you want to say a return to roots album. Um, Keys to the Kingdom makes it pretty evident from the get-go. Okay, this is, they mean business. Uh, Guilty All the Same with Rakim. I like that track. Wastelands uh, was a single. Until It's Gone has In the End Vibes, Rebellion, yes. Drawbar, yes. Uh, Final Masquerade, yes. War, War is the most punk thing they've done since if you hated Minutes to Midnight and A Thousand Suns and Living Things, I bet you this is probably where you felt like, ah, they're back. Uh, and this album doesn't really feel like they're phoning it in. It's not like, well, we better do another heavy album again. To me, this album is like, if we started all over today, this is what we would sound like. Uh, in fact, I hate how much I like this album, really, because I I like the more, I, I really like the more balanced and electronically flavored version of Linkin Park better. I don't hate to use the term mellower. You know, I, I really enjoy the steak. I just want a nice, smooth glass of Chianti to, to pair with it. Does that make sense? <laughs> I would not say that this is one of my favorite, favorite albums. I would not say that it's a classic, but something's got to go on this great tier. And this is definitely great. I mean, there's just nothing wrong with this album. There's no reason to dislike this album other than you wish it had a little bit more atmosphere to it. Maul, the band made a game. Okay, this is ambitious, and it's it's interesting to check out. I don't really feel like this is I, I don't know personally. I I just didn't I just didn't care. Uh, in 2017, one more light. You remember how I said I hated how much I loved the hunting party because it just really lacked balance and it didn't have a lot of atmosphere and it was just so damn crunchy and and angry and and it was just but it did such a damn good job of doing that. Well, one more light is where. It was the band's fifth number one album, so obviously people were wanting to check it out. Um, there were four singles, Heavy, Battle Symphony, uh, Good Goodbye. Uh, Talking to Myself was the first single released after Chester Bennington's passing. Um, what did you think the first time you heard the ironically titled Heavy? Invisible is a very a personal song about fatherhood. I, I wanted to like it. Lyrically, I kind of like it. But so much of this album is so pop. And I don't hate pop music. It just feels like the, the production of this album really wanted to be, let's really lean into being, let's lean into making a pop album. It's almost like it wanted to be a 21 Pilots album or something. Not every song is bad, uh, but the guitars are basically just all gone after roaring back to life on The Hunting Party. Why? I, I The title track is potentially... A really good song. And you know, there's still time. There's still time. Give give the master tapes or master files to Trent Reznor and see see what he can do with it. You know, because I like the band I want to I want to at least say that it's okay, but I'll be real honest with you, I would just leave this out of my collection. As far as the passing of Chester Bennington goes, um I definitely I, I don't want to go on a big long tangent here, but I will say that a lot of the world is full of people who do not understand, respect, the incredible destructive power of depression. And it's sad. In 2017, One More Light Live. Uh, recorded um, early in the band's One More Light World Tour in 2017. Uh, it was the first album to be released after Chester Bennington's passing. Again, it, it has a lot of stuff from One More Light, which brings it down a notch or two in my opinion, but it's uh, sonically it's good. Band plays well. Chester's bringing it. The 20th anniversary edition of Hybrid Theory. Uh, there was a track released from this called She Couldn't, which didn't really gain any, any real traction. I think people kind of didn't necessarily know what to do with a new-ish Linkin Park song. I'm really not sure where to put it. Um, I don't really feel, this feels insulting to Hybrid Theory. No, you know what? I'm just going to, if Hybrid Theory is a classic favorite, and same thing uh, with Meteora. Meteora did contain a track. The Meteora 20th anniversary package featured a track called Lost, which was a good song. I mean, I can, in a way, I can see why it was left off of Meteora, because it was just kind of one more song that sounded like, <laughs> that kind of sounded like, it sounded a little bit like numb. But the great thing about holding off on releasing a song like that for 20 years, you've got a new classic Linkin Park song, so. So I think that's pretty cool. It was good to hear Lost. I really enjoyed Lost. In April of 2024, Paper Cuts, the single collection, 2000 to 2023, was released. Uh, it features the Numb Encore collaboration with Jay-Z. If you didn't want to have to get Collision Course to have that on, 
on physical media. Uh, Friendly Fire was a track that they dug up from the One More Light sessions. Here's the funny thing. Maybe maybe they tweaked the production a little bit before they dropped this in 2024. Friendly Fire would have been the best song on One More Light. You know, this is a pretty solid, this is a pretty solid best of compilation. I'm not going to say that it's earth shattering. It's definitely not, it's not a, a classic compilation. If you don't want to have a big Linkin Park collection and you want to have the hits and you want to have them on physical media, okay, get the singles. I won't shame you for being, for, for being a best of person. And in November of 2024, from Zero. I don't know if she's officially departed Dead Sarah, a good band that I like that does not sound like Linkin Park. I'd hate to see Dead Sarah dissolve if she has. I have a theory that Emily Armstrong was chosen to add to Linkin Park so that no one would be able to negatively compare some other dude to Chester Bennington. So no one would be able to say, well, that guy's a Chester Bennington clone, or that guy's not even half as good as Chester, or whatever, because a lot of people don't really have the best feelings about Linkin Park even coming back with no Chester. Emily Armstrong is a vibe all her own, in my opinion. Yes, she can belt it out. Hashtag heavy is the crown, with its one second shorter than Chester Bennington's 17 second roar in giving up. I wonder if that was on purpose. This is what I asked for. I didn't know this was what I asked for, but this album's second single is an absolute banger. It's an instant Linkin Park classic, in my opinion. The Emptiness Machine was a solid first single. Over Each Other was already out before From Zero landed on November 15th, so you can check out the whole the whole album. How was the whole album on the whole? It's 31 minutes long, so there's not a lot of room for error. So if there's anything bad, it really kind of sticks out. But, but being so short, basically, by the time you'd even lift a finger to hit a skip button, it's already over. You've already heard it all. So just let this be a no skips experience if you haven't already heard it. Cut the Bridge is kind of a throwback to Minutes to Midnight, maybe. Stain features some almost beautiful vocals from Emily Armstrong. Vocally, there's a nice dichotomy on this song. Casualty is a pretty fierce track with uh, intense vocal performances from Armstrong and uh, Mike Shinoda. It's the most intense track overall in the album. It has high party vibes um and then it rolls straight into the very moody very atmospheric overflow i give you everything i have is intense but melodic but intense but it has a melody to it but it's very intense uh good things go the album's closer that's a solid solid track and i would say don't be surprised if that's not released as a single and a video sometime in the relatively near future so i think that from zero is a strong if maybe kind of predictable new beginning for Linkin Park. I would put it on this tier. And just my opinion, but if you want to put it lower than that, I'm I'm not sure you're giving it a fair shot. Um, I think the band knew that, that deciding to come back was going to be met with a certain amount of resistance. And I think they really... Let me put it this way. They didn't make One More Light Part 2. Now, did they? So feel free to share your thoughts and comments. Yays, nays, what the hell are you thinkings? Uh, in the comments, share with a friend. I'm going to put uh, a couple more of my tier list videos up here so you can check those out if you want. It's up to you, of course, but hopefully I'll catch you next time.